Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Thank you. Oh. So, yeah. Uh, it's a surprisingly large picture of myself on the screen behind, which is always a realization that uh, I shouldn't have worn the same tie. Uh, but anyway, um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paul Rennie, and it is a massive pleasure for me to be here uh, representing the British government uh, and working with our great friends and partners here at uh, University of North Carolina to talk a bit about uh, the world after COP and going forward after, after COP. As you can all imagine, we're all a little bit exhausted after COP. We had this slightly epic opportunity to spend two years preparing for COP. Uh, and the small matter of a global pandemic to contend with as we actually got around to hosting it in Glasgow. Uh, but nonetheless, it's amazing for us to be here to keep talking about that COP journey and to keep talking about what we've learned, what we want to achieve in the kind of year going ahead. But before I get into that, I want to start with a, a little story. And I want to start with a story partly because I think stories are very memorable. Uh, and if nothing else, you might remember this story about my presentation. But also the story is quite an interesting historical tale about how times change and technology changes with it. And the story is about stagecoaches in Britain in the 1820s, so 100 years ago in Britain. And stagecoaches were the dominant form of transportation. And not only were the dominant form of transportation in Britain, they'd been the dominant form of transportation for about 4,000 years. And this was a high technology industry. You had a man called Obadiah Elliott who just registered a new patent for spring suspension. John Besson, had pioneered a new system for braking and turning and something he labeled as an innovative way to stop the wheels falling off. I don't know what they did before he was able to stop the wheels falling off the stagecoaches. And John McAdam was laying new roads that were taking stagecoach transport from a meandering six miles an hour to a breakneck eight miles per hour. And for those of you that know the DC area, that's about the same speed as the Beltway on Friday afternoon. This was a place where prices were falling, comfort was rising, and the industry was in a golden age. On the 15th of September, 1830, the first train ran between Liverpool and Manchester. And within two decades, the stagecoach industry was wiped out. A 4,000 year old industry dead in 20 years. There's a couple of reasons I like this story and why I think it's hugely relevant for any of us thinking about technology and climate and the way things can change. Because the first is it reminds us just how quickly things can change, even when you think an industry or a way of existing has been that way almost forever. Because we talk a lot about tipping points in the climate debate, but often we talk about the negative aspects of tipping points, ocean currents, the loss of biodiversity. And I think we don't spend enough remembering that actually in the last few years, I think we've reached a very positive tipping point and how we're looking at climate change, not just at a country level, but I think the way individuals and companies are thinking about it. Now in the UK, we've experienced some of that journey in the way things have changed for us recently. Back in 2008, we set ourselves a target that we were going to make an 80% reduction in our, 2000, in our 1990 levels of emissions, an 80% reduction by 2050. And that sounded amazing. Except for the fact that you can guess pretty much 100% of British companies thought they would be in the 20% that got exempt. So it was not exactly the level of change in energy you might expect in spite of having set the 80% goal. In 2019, not least in preparation for our COP presidency, we made that goal 100% reduction in emissions. And that changed the game because suddenly every company in Britain Every household in Britain, every part of the media realized that they would be involved in making that happen. Even the things we would describe as the hard to decarbonize sectors. And that change in mindset is significant. We moved again in the build up to COP when the Prime Minister announced as part of his 10 point climate plan, we would phase out the sale of all gas cars and vans by 2030 and phase out all hybrid vehicles by 2035. Now you can imagine that was a massive shift. The auto industry was, well, you can't do that. 2040 had been the goal that seemed far away. 2030 is only eight years away. But again, this point about a tipping moment, if you in the UK know that by 2030, you will not be able to buy another gas powered vehicle, you're making decisions now about buying choices. And that's putting pressure on industry to change, on the charging infrastructure to change, and it supports that kind of tipping point to come. And, 
Even in the US, I was amazed. We've been you know, listening to the story of the F-150 Lightning, the F-150, America's most popular vehicle bar none. And now there's the F-150 Lightning. As one of my colleagues in the industry was saying, companies hate to run two production lines. So once you see the F-150 sales start to come ahead and get towards 30, 40%, what tends to happen in companies is they shut down the old production line and go all in in the new. So again, that moment of tipping point and change is critical. And that's why I like the story about the stagecoaches and how they've moved ahead. But the second thing about the stagecoach story that I find interesting is why was it the stagecoach owners weren't the ones investing in the new technology? You know, they'd have asked if they'd been told, what business are you in? They'd probably have said, oh, we're in the transportation business. But really they behaved like they were in the horse and cart business, not the steam and steel business. And I think when it comes to the climate journey, companies out there that are not thinking about what business they are in and how they can enable that business in a climate enabled environment are going to really struggle. Now, back then for the stagecoach owners, I can imagine it must have seemed impossible to think about that level of scale. I mean, saying to a stagecoach owner with an average of 18 people in their stagecoach, there's this thing called a train that carries 100 people at a time, it would be like saying to Boeing today, I can make you a plane that seats 2,000 people. It would have seemed impossible to imagine from a technological level. And yet now, we are asking people to think globally. We're asking companies to think globally. And the SEC's recent statement about how it wants companies to consider its approach to climate change is doing not just where your energy comes from and how you operate yourself, but asks companies to think hard about the supply chains and where things go. Now, I'd like to believe that companies are able to modernize and, take embrace, and embrace technology in different ways, but then still you see companies like Tesla, which have emerged to be worth more money than the next five car manufacturers combined in the space of less than a decade, is a reminder for, I think, any company out there, if you don't have a plan on climate, you're going to find that others do, and they will overtake you. And I think my message to anyone in that space is, remember, one of the apocryphal tales of the stagecoach story is it's much better to be the stagecoach driver than the stagecoach horse. They had different kinds of futures in the modern world, and that, I think, is the story for them. Now, that story, if you remember nothing else from me, is a tale about the context of which we entered COP. Because all of us would like to believe when we host the COP presidency that ours was particularly special. We were able to do things and achieve things that others could not. But while many of us are kind of breathing a sigh of relief, COP26 is just the starting gun for all the work we have to do afterwards. And to some climate cynics, they'd argue it's actually the 26th starting gun, because we've done a lot of starting guns in the COP journey. But nonetheless, what I think about this one that is different is we finally have the meeting between the technological capability, the popular will, the private sector incentives to actually live up to some of the climate goals we've been trying to set ourselves. Now, when it came to our own work at COP, we were hugely proud of what we achieved. COP26 saw 197 parties agree to the Glasgow Climate Pact. And with it, we hopefully have tried to narrow the ambition gap of what we're trying to achieve. Net zero commitments now cover 90% of the global economy, which is up from 30% two years ago before we took on the role. And again, that point about net zero commitments is key because it creates expectations. It means people project into the future and companies project into the future about what it is they're trying to get. And from that COP summit, we also set ourselves four key goals, four key elements we want to keep driving ahead during our presidency. The first is to ensure we can reduce emissions as companies had, as countries had promised, to reduce emissions and keep alive the 1.5 degree shift that we think is still achievable. And that means asking every country to live up to its goals. It means asking every country's governments and companies and the citizens to live up to the goals they had made themselves during COP. The second is we want to make progress on adaptation and loss and damage. Now that means working with donors agencies, working with countries, to make the goals real in terms of financing. Adaptation and mitigation are not free. And we recognize during COP, we continue to recognize, that means thinking very hard about how we support other countries on their journeys towards adaptation and mitigation, and how we operationalize what was called the Santiago Dialogue ahead of COP26, which Egypt will be hosting later this year. The third thing is we have to deliver the money for this. COP26 committed us to $100 billion a year for climate financing. We have to deliver that. That is the money effectively that the developing world looks to us and says, if you're serious about the change, if you're serious about the adaptation, where is the money? 
And the 100 billion commitment is key to take us there. But at the same time, in many respects, it's just the ante at the poker table. Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, is talking about the $11 trillion we need to find in order to support decarbonizing the world's economy. Already part of his GFANS alliance, the Glasgow Alliance Towards Net Zero, suggests there's $130 trillion worth of assets out there which are now committed to net zero investments. And it was a pleasure hearing our colleague from the Bank of America talking over lunch about how companies are doing that. So again, how do we raise the finance and how do we put the finance to work? And our fourth and final goal is how we can push further action across critical sectors such as coal and cars and ending deforestation and all the other elements that are the hard to decarbonize elements like cement and steel and aviation. Now, self-evidently, in all of this, technology has a role to play. And I think about the technology in three ways. I think about known technologies and known markets. So we work with our colleagues in Maine or in North Carolina. We're thinking about offshore wind. That's a known technology. Britain's done offshore wind. Now it has the largest installed offshore wind capacity in the world. Known technology, known markets should be dead easy. That's really not a place the government, I think, can add a lot of value unless it's setting up the right regulations and the right structures. Then you've got known technologies in unknown markets. How are we getting offshore wind into Tanzania? What are we doing about solar in Kenya? These are known technologies. We've been deploying them for decades. But these are markets where they're untested, where people have concerns about the stability of the economy, of the framework of the regulations. And again, how does government play a role in that? How do we support de-risking the investments of technologies we understand into markets that have been less trafficked by some of the renewable energy sources? And the third element, frankly, and this sounds a bit Rumsfeldian, I know, is the unknown technologies. There are things out there that we are just beginning to understand how we can deploy. And critically for me, as we think about these new technologies, we have to think about their application globally. So much of what we've developed over the years has been very sort of Western world centric, developed economy centric, because that's the place where we're trying to figure out how we get the money and the investment to work. But if we're looking at how the global planet works when it comes to um, the carbon output, the planet doesn't care whether that's a ton of carbon from Indonesia or a ton of carbon from Indiana. But it makes a massive difference to the technologies we develop as to whether they'll be effective and applicable around the world. So that technological part is key. And it's where the moonshots come from that I know many of you in the audience will be thinking about right now. And of course, the context of COP three months ago and where we are today, it'd be impossible not to talk about Russia's war in Ukraine. Because on the one hand, that has kind of upended people's perceptions about global inflation rates, the trajectory of the global economy, and critically about energy and energy supply. And it'll come as no surprise to many of you that within the European discussion, there's been people who've wondered, have we got into this situation of dependency because we went too fast on our decarbonizing agenda or not fast enough? But at the same time, I think the situation we find ourselves in in Europe has proven some of the fundamental truths about COP in terms of how we are trying to find our journey to net zero. I was speaking last month at a Texas Energy Summit, and a lot of people there talk about price, in, uh, about uh, energy independence. Well, my point to them was well, energy independence is great, but energy independence is not price independence. And that is really the political journey you face right now with global energy supply. The good folks of Texas who are taking the oil out of the ground are not selling it to their neighbors at $50 a barrel just out of the goodness of their hearts. The irony is that renewable power actually generates the best price independence you can imagine. If I, if I were stumping for Congress, I'd probably want to call it freedom energy or something like that. Because the truth is, while you can take your barrel of oil or your tank full of gas and put it on a boat to anywhere in the world, it's very hard to move a wind farm. Even the offshore floating ones probably take a while to get across the Atlantic. So when it comes to thinking about geopolitics, when it comes to acceleration of change, Understanding the problem you face, not in terms of energy independence, but how you're able to get consistency of supply. And as the popular demand is why my gas price is going up 30% in the last eight weeks, it'd be hard to imagine that happening to a kilowatt in your car with the right mix of renewable power and renewable energy. And again, when you look at Europe's situation just now, in light of the Russian war, you're also beginning to understand what I see as another tipping point. People's minds will shift in this journey. European countries are thinking much harder already about their energy efficiency, some of it enforced if they are concerned about supply, but more generally thinking much harder about how do I consume less fuel? How do I have a carbon mix 
that is less reliant upon certain kinds of coal or oil or gas. And if there are any positives to take from the terrible tragedy that's happening in Ukraine, it is that. People will think harder about their energy matrix and how to bring new, uh, renewables together. And also nuclear, I should say. I mean, we don't talk much about nuclear in the renewables debate, but that is something the UK is also looking at again, is how nuclear power remains part of our baseload and part of our supply. And I think as we see that change and we see that acceleration, it is really taking forward the next generation of people's views on technology and how we can live up to the COP goals. We're going to keep accelerating that in the UK. It is our intention and our ambition to meet these targets at COP and accelerate them wherever possible. But on the net zero specifically, we're also looking at how we can strengthen our support in the international space and international collaborations. As I said at the start, the plant doesn't care where the ton of carbon comes from, but it does care massively about whether we are able to work together as a community to make these goals real. The UK government's committed to not just looking at our partnerships here with the US, which we have a great many here in North Carolina, in Maine and elsewhere. And my colleague, Justin Sosny, who is from our office in Raleigh, who is going to be speaking in the next session a lot more about our offshore wind relationship here, but also how we work across the states in the US more generally, the subnational level. The thing we've been most struck by in our work with the US over the last two or three years is that the subnational levels of the US government have incredible power to make change and make uh, kind of the climate journey real. Even as the federal government is also under the current president renewing that ambition and that agenda, at the subnational level, and particularly at the state level and the city level, the connectivity those politicians have to the population, the demands the population have for effective public transport, for reducing pollution in their neighborhoods, these are the kinds of individual changes that help to drive the macro change we want to see. And throughout all these partnerships, we're thinking at turn, at always about how we then take that bilateral relationship abroad. We work together with the US because we have such a close alliance and a close partnership. But how do we work together in India? How do we work together in Indonesia? How are each of you in the partnerships you're making around your work and your fields, not just taking that as a bilateral relationship, but taking it out to the rest of the world? Because again, through those partnerships, we're not just able to transfer knowledge and learning but to learn and take knowledge in turn from other places and other parts of the world. One of the most interesting projects I worked on last year was with a colleague who had begun something called Slum Zero, which was a project to reduce emissions among slums. And again, his point was people keep thinking about countries and cities and big urban environments, but with hundreds of millions of people living in slum housing and slum situations, how are you tackling the environmental challenges that they face? And again, the learning and the journey that goes with that is how we share our expertise and take it in turn to find solutions. And I'm probably going to close now with another small story about the nature of society in the change, because we talk about technologies. I talk about the COP world. We talk about federal governments and the kind of large scale changes. But I think the critical thing for us when it comes to making this change real is how we take communities and societies with us. I grew up in a small mining village just outside Edinburgh. And by the time I was growing up, the pits had closed and the mines had closed and everything had shut down, but the old miners were still there. Now, nobody in that village mourned the fact that I was not going to spend the next 20 years of my life working underground mining coal. Uh, I'm not entirely sure they'd believe that one day I'd be standing under like a 12 foot picture of myself in the University of North Carolina, but either way, they were pleased I wasn't going to mine coal. But what they did mourn was the loss of community. It was the loss of the working men's club. It was the loss of the village fair and the loss of the church field when the young people moved away to find other opportunities. And the closing point I would make to all of us when we think about the climate journey and how we use technology to support it is how we ensure it is a just transition. That we're ensuring as we transition away from the old ways of doing business, from the stagecoaches of the past to the steam trains of the future, that we're able to bring all of the communities and all of society with us. And I think that just transition is not just about how we're doing it within your country or within your state, but how we do it for the whole world. And why adaptation and mitigation and support for everybody's climate journey really matters. Because otherwise the risk will always be the sense that we have pulled up the ladder from a community or from a country or from individuals who are at a different part of the developmental chain. And we cannot let that to become the narrative that dominates tensions in the debate rather than cooperation to find a solution that all of us will benefit from. I'll draw my rights to close there and otherwise wish you all the very best of success in all the work you're doing and the very best of luck, particularly for the young people who are here and the students we had a great lunch with today. Um, you are the kind of vision for the future we need because ultimately 
you have a much bigger stake in the planet, I'm afraid, than I do today. But you also want to go and have the innovation we need to make it the kind of planet you want to grow up on. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, did we, I'm not sure if we want to do some questions. Did we mark this question? Yes, yeah, so I think we've got five minutes for questions. Want, sir, I don't know if we probably have to project if that's all right, sir. Do you want to? I'll, I'll, I'll just... Incentives for investors, so a market driven uh, uh, part of what is in effect a subsidy for innovation as opposed to sort of direct government subsidies and choices. And I'm just curious how effective that has been if, if the government's done an analysis of that. It's been around for 20 years or so. And secondly, if it's something that you want to expand specifically in relation to climate change. And then thirdly, have you thought about exporting that idea elsewhere? Because it seems to be uh, uh, yeah, a great opportunity in a way to build uh, a market-driven uh, assistance from the government. Thank you for that. No, so I think the first thing is I don't have the data on that to hand. We will undoubtedly have done some analysis of how it's gone. So I will endeavor to look that out. The, the British government loves to analyze policies. It's the kind of thing we do. So I'm sure there's been data out there. Um, what is interesting, the wider point around how the government supports these journeys is we've been doing a lot of different things. And living in the US now, it's very interesting how the federal state dynamic is quite a big component in how you work. Whereas in the UK, we have a more unitary system. So the government centrally is able to deploy money in a lot of different ways that it's not quite so easy for the federal government to do. On the energy markets, we've definitely looked to subsidize things like wind power development. Um, you know, the way we set up strike price pricing or pump priming elements of that activity has been key for us because we've recognized you need to enable the incentives up front to get the investment to start. And once the ball is rolling, it moves quite quickly. Um, for things like offshore wind, we've also frankly benefited from the fact that somewhere like Aberdeen, which has been the heart of our offshore wind uh, development, has also been the heart in previous years of our offshore oil and gas industry. So a lot of the skills and expertise we have needed have been sort of in the right place. Whereas I'm conscious that in the US, some of the skills and expertise that exist in the old kind of thermal generation of energy are not always in the places on the coast to, to come next with that. So that's been the first part. It's been a big element about how we've helped to subsidize the next generation of, of technologies. We've also obviously taxed more heavily on the bad, on the bad carbon elements, if you like. So the British uh, price of gas in the UK is at the moment about 65% tax. So you think about in the US, you know, people talking about lifting up a little bit of federal tax here, 5% I think is federal gas tax. 65% of every gallon you put in your car in the UK is tax. Now, the kind of the good element of that is obviously it incentivizes better behavior, ideally, because people are seeing the price of gas very high. They want fuel efficient vehicles across the board. Interestingly, it also insulates us more from shocks because effectively only 35% of our price of gas is, is global prices. So you do not see the wild swings you see in the US in terms of percentage change in our gallon of gas. But those tax structures have also over time pushed people into more innovation. So to your third point, sir, about innovation is we are subsidizing that too. We are trying to find, we've got certain clusters and catapult clusters looking at ways to help support innovation and technology. But we're really hoping that through the right kind of tax and regulatory system, the innovation will come by itself, it kind of fills that gap because people want to innovate away from unpleasant taxation on carbon products. They want to innovate towards government subsidies that will help them to build wind power or new elements of kind of renewable power. And then hopefully between the two of those, a little bit of government support for new thinking and new ideas will kind of catch fire. The key thing for me as an economist and someone working for the government is that any plan we have has to be sustainable without government support. And I think that is always the risk, is if government goes down a path of trying to incentivize or put money towards a particular kind of industry without having a clear idea about how it becomes self-sustaining. Now, the self-sustaining possibly through regulation that forces you into certain paths. Um, it's going to be very hard to, to keep working. And I think the, the thing about innovation is also for me that, and again, being a UN seed now is a great example of innovation in practice, is that you should always be innovating to the next step of the curve. 
So how are you moving from kind of pioneering research and genuinely over the horizon thinking towards innovation within companies who are applying things like offshore winds today and doing research in wind turbines and wind blades that doesn't have to be government supported because the market incentives are driving their actions. And I'll find out some more about the data you've talked about, sir, if I can. Any other questions? Gentleman here and then the lady here. So um, a good example of that, I think, is going to be uh, electric cars and electric car charging ports. Uh, because right now, everybody has, I love, the, I love the phrase range anxiety when it comes to electric vehicles. It's just a wonderful phrase, range anxiety. And of course, people have got a lot of range anxiety when it comes to electric cars. So the, the British government's decision to switch out gas vehicles from 2030 will have a massive impact on people's perception of how far can I go in my electric car? Because not everybody's got like a Tesla Model S with a million miles of, of speed. But I bet you, like back in the kind of late 1800s, when the first gas fueled cars came out, people probably had the same range anxiety back then. They'd have been like, well, wait a minute, your car goes like six miles on an entire tank of gas, whereas my horse goes on forever and I can stop my horse wherever I want. And the horse can just eat grass and I can keep going on my horse. It's brilliant. You know, these crazy gas cars never catch on. So I think for me, that's a good example of how do we then come to that question with electric vehicles in the UK? Because we will need to help. And I mean, we are right now compelling change in the market. So by our decision to end gas fired cars, we are compelling the purchase of electric vehicles. That's a regulatory system we basically adopted. We are helping to some extent support the, the, the high speed charging network around the country. But ultimately, what we hope is that industry, because of that overwhelming consumer demand for electric vehicles and electric charging points, in the same way that in the 1920s America, the overwhelming demand for gas led to millions and millions of people setting up gas stations all over America, we will support that change. So I think for me, it is about kind of this other gentleman's point as well, how we pump prime through regulation and support the initial shift. And critically, I think that government policy does not become reversible. I think if you start to see government policies that yo-yo up and down, people always wonder, is this change going to stick or not going to stick? And I think the government has been you know, very solid in saying, this is the change we will deliver and we're not coming back from it. We're not about to unwind our electric car commitment in 2026. That would be devastating. And again, the point about 100% reduction means that everybody in industry knows you're part of the answer and part of the solution. Lady here. So I tell you what, um, the vast bulk of the pressure in my household towards climate solutions comes from my 11 year old daughter. Uh, and I'm not entirely convinced that's just because of classroom support. I think just her friends just care a lot about the environment and the planet. And during my like 25 years of being a diplomat, I've, I've spent a lot of years kind of talking with schools. And for the last 25 years, when I ask any group of school children what their biggest concern is about international issues or even local issues, They've always said climate change, just always have said climate change. My hope is that the school sort of kids of any generation start to become adults and start to make policy changes. So, you know, I kind of grew up and it's probably showing a bit of my age, but I think some of the audience will appreciate this. I grew up with a hole in the ozone layer. That was, that was the thing. The hole in the ozone layer was going to kill us all. You know, never mind, you know, whales and saving the pandas. Like the hole in the ozone layer was going to, and especially living in Britain, we're quite far north. You saw the maps, the, the hole was coming to Britain first. And I live in Scotland, which is the north of Britain. So Scotland was definitely first for this whole ozone layer. So I think young people have always been very active about that. And I think in a way they are driving that nature of debate within the classroom. Now, whether or not we have to make it mandatory to have climate discussions in schools is a, is a quite a complex political discussion about how much you want to get involved in what schools do and don't do. And I know in America, that's a big thing. Um, but like recycling bins everywhere in school, and the fact that schools talk to kids about which stuff do you put in which recycling bin. And frankly, in my office, we only got these things in the last five years, you know, recycling bins for all the different kinds. Of, I've got like, we've got so many bins in my office, I've just got no idea where anything goes. I just try not to eat at work anymore because I'm afraid, is it compostable or not compostable? So I think that is, that for me, that is the drive. So I think the answer to your question is that we have to make it available for children to understand the world they live in. 
And I am pretty sure that by understanding that world, they will come to the kind of conclusions which any young people do, any 11 year old does, which is it's better to have a planet that works than a planet that's broken. Uh, and kids are the best innovators in that regard. And uh, without a doubt, the biggest source of lobbying in my house is my 11 year old daughter. I do have time for one more question. Otherwise, I think we'll call it your time, are we? Time. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. And wonderful luck in the rest of your endeavors today. Thank you.